This episode of the podcast is brought to you by New Bloom Labs. You guys have heard me say this before. Lab testing is one of the biggest, most frustrating bottlenecks in our industry. It's simply unacceptable to wait one, two weeks, or even longer for a full panel analysis for your cannabis products. That's why you need to know about New Bloom Labs. The guys at New Bloom Labs are the real deal. With locations in Tennessee and Texas and more to come soon, New Bloom Labs provides precise, accurate analysis and the best turnaround time in the industry. New Bloom always provides next business day turnaround on potency tests and one to two business day turnaround on most toxin screenings. They're ISO certified and DEA registered, so you know their science is first rate. Most cannabis producers are frustrated with their third-party labs, but guess what? You don't have to be. Call New Bloom Labs at 844-TEST-CBD or visit their website at newbloomlabs.com. Superior science, rapid results, New Bloom Labs. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by our friends at Regrow, the premier cloud-based cannabis supply chain management system. Are your SOPs tied directly to your cultivation plans? Can you easily manage your inventory and workforce and vendors from a single system? Or do you have the ability to manage compliance across multiple licenses and states? If you said no to any of these questions, then you need to know about Regrow. Regrow is the single pane of glass view into your entire supply chain, available globally with native localization and foreign language support. If you have a vertically integrated and or multi-state operation, Regrow will help you increase your revenue while keeping your entire operation fully compliant. If you're a cannabis company searching for a strategic business partner to help you automate your business, scale effectively, and make the supply chain work for you, you can find regrow at regrow.io that's regrow.io regrow the premier cloud-based cannabis supply chain management system hello everyone kevin carrillo here and welcome to another episode of the cannabinoid connects podcast my guest today is antonio frazier president at canasafe We're recording. Antonio, what is up, man? Welcome back. Uh, yeah, Kevin, uh, thanks for uh, being patient with me and my uh, fresh haircut here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, from, I... the, from the one to a zero, uh, but uh, <laughs> thanks for allowing me to get myself together. And uh, I'm really excited about being on today. So how was your holiday? Yeah, no, it was good, man. Um, I, I It was great. I We visited my wife's uh, family and spent a lot of time with her mom and uh, and her dad. So um, we, we enjoyed it. And I know that when we talked last time, um, before we record today, we, we had, had, we kind of shared our passion for music, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and vinyl records. And for those just listening, uh, Antonio, he saw that I have a, a big vinyl collection in, in the back here. So um, I'm bringing that up because Santa brought me two albums for Christmas. So that, oh, was, okay. that was cool. I got you yeah. too. So let me hear about yours. All right. Cool, cool, cool. So I got um, Weezer and I got Inc- uh, Incubus Morning View. Okay. Which uh, Weezer album? I, I I was looking before we recorded. It's the one that has Sweater Song. I forget the name of the album, though. Oh, it's the blue cool. one. Okay. Um, yeah. This is a good band though. I got some Weezer. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't have an issue this though. Uh okay, dope. Well I treated, I treated myself actually, so I can't claim Santa brought it, but it was coming as a package I bought from the Netherlands, I think. So it took about, you know, a few weeks for it to get here. So it was like perfect time for Christmas. But um it was the Kill Bill Volume One soundtrack. Oh yes. Uh, was a good one. Uh Tame Impala. Um uh what the vibes are wait, I can't think of I can't think of the name of it. Um Waves or Currents? I can't. I don't know. I, I can't think of this. It. It's, it, it's their like essential album on. Um, Got you. On yeah. Instagram. And then finally, it was uh, what was it? Uh, I can't think what the last one was. Oh, Stevie Wonder. When he was twelve years old, he had like a, some like rare recording of Stevie Wonder. He was twelve years old in the studio, cut a bunch of live music, and did a bunch of covers. Wow. So, uh, yes, that was dope. 12, 12 years old? He had it. Yeah, a, 12 years old. Yeah, I, actually, I mean, I'll shoot you some uh, pictures of it. And then, actually, I did get gifts. My mother in law from Denmark gave me three of their old jazz albums and two Motown records that they sent over that they've had for, I mean, these things are from the 50s, I think. I mean, they've had these albums for 
sometime and they're all like super crisp and clean. They smell just like their house. It's kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so first press, right? They would be first press if they're originals. So that's, you yeah. got to hold on to those, man. That's but nice. That, no, for real. I'm like, they should get me some special ones there for sure. So uh, super excited about it. And we played them all weekend. I mean, the good thing about being home, I'm not home this much. You know, we just play vinyls all day, all day, all day, all day. So, right. Thanks yeah. 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 Of course. I mean, that's what I'm doing when I'm not recording podcasts. We're playing uh, the vinyl record and just going through the album. So it's it's something about that nostalgic needle, you know, just putting it on the record. And yeah. It's, it's a it's a it's, so cool. it's, it's a commitment, man. We we don't commit to much stuff these days. So it's nice to be like, hey, this better be good music if we're playing it through. You know, you got to get up to flip it. So it's like you have to want to do it. So you can't play BS. Yeah. Uh, it's something, yeah, it's it's tangible, right? It's like everything's digital today. So the fact that you can hold the music and like own it and put it on a shelf is is pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree. Totally. Well, hey, guys, for those listening, I have Antonio Frazier on. He's the president at CannaSafe, which is a fully accredited cannabis and hemp testing lab in Southern California. And y'all were the first accredited and licensed lab in Can uh, in California, I believe. First receiving accredited lab, correct. Licensed, no, but first accredited lab uh, in California, yes. Yeah, that that ISO, what is it, seventeen twenty five accreditation? That's huge, man. No, through five, yeah, it's huge. You know, it's the international lab spec for a quality control system for a lab. It's pretty much do what you say you're going to do and make it traceable. I mean, ISO doesn't mean you know what you're doing exactly for testing, but it shows that you have a system where you know if everyone wants to question any results, you have traceable data and you can look at it and obviously be able to confess if you make a mistake or be able to pinpoint where that data went wrong. You know, it's just an idea of accountability is what you could think of it as. Got you. Got you. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's awesome. And, you know, I'm really excited because CannaSafe, I mean, you, what you guys have 30% of the market share in California uh, when it comes to lab testing. So there's a lot of different things that I'm excited to talk to you about today in the lab testing space. Okay. Um, so let's Stop. first, let's do it, man. So first let's start before we jump into all that, I want to get uh, people to understand a little bit about your background. So from my understanding, you began as a nuclear quality engineer in Tennessee. And then after that, you moved into aerospace engineering. And now you're in the cannabis lab testing space. So talk us kind of through that journey and what, what, what brought you to cannabis. Okay, so first and foremost, um, I got my degree in materials engineering. That was from Clemson University, as well as I got a bachelor of science from Furman. So I had two undergrad degrees because of where I went to school was liberal arts. I, well, I, I played football, so I had a scholarship to do all this. So I had to go somewhere where they were paying for it. You know, I wasn't trying to go, go into debt. So that was a very fortunate thing I came out of. Uh, through that, through a kind of... Uh, I guess you could call it uh, nepotism in the system. My mom was like one of the first black engineers at TVA, one of the first managers, so high prestige. And then um, fortunately she passed away as I was in high school, but through that was able to come back and get an immediate job working at their wild spark construction unit. So as a materials engineer, my first industry or my first matrix I dealt with was material was metal was metallurgy. So metals in a nuclear plant. So you know you have um, all these pressure systems and different types of uh, mediums, whether it be water, coolant, whatever it may be flowing through this place. You gotta make sure they're one, they're not leaking, you know, and then two, that uh, they're the appropriate type of um, uh, material for the corrosion, temperature, whatever it may be. There's all these different things you have to consider an adaptation, but it was pretty cool. I mean, one of my favorite things was working on the uh, stud hole vessels, uh, the actual, the thing that goes on top of the reactor, the shell, there's these humongous stud holes that I mean, bigger than me, that are this big and probably like, you know, two feet deep and these bolts and stars are massive. And I got to lead the project to remediate those because it was an old plant. Wow. Uh, that, you wow. know, it was pretty cool. And really working with the pipe fitters and uh, laborers, I, I learned more from those men and women than any degree will give you. You know, these people have like 40 years experience. So got a really like in-depth, really stringent work environment. Like in nuclear, in a nuclear plant, if you walk into a room, you have to sign that you're there. Like, you know, there, there's such an accountability. There's no level of, um, you're not really able to maneuver. Every All, all your work is transparent. Every Everything, ship, everything's documented. Point. Everything's documented. You're probably on camera surveil surveillance. 24 exactly. seven yeah exactly i have a dosimeter that has a tracking i mean like everywhere i am they know where i am I'm key card and everywhere you can't tell okay literally i remember having to like badge in close the door like sorry dude like close the door and then let them c c come in behind you just because of the way that you can get in trouble like you can get written up if you allow people to do things as such so really my first job was um just that way so i never knew anything but you know 
uh, above ground work. I went from having my professor grading my work to the U, the, the United States Regulatory Committee re, uh, <laughs> uh, guarding my uh, grading my work. So there was never really any time for me to think this, of anything but you know yeah. consumer safety. The stakes but, are a bit higher when it when it comes to the the U.S. government, right? So yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> the people going to people on, on my work site that have been to jail, people I worked with that you know for falsifying docs. So it's very very serious. So yeah. that being said, that was like the shock factor of me, you know, going into the consumer safety uh, network, and then I ended up going to aerospace where we were doing. A, I worked in a foundry and a heat treat facility in a machine shop uh, as the miller just on staff to help with all these processes. These special processes, very unique processes, very low tolerance, like a thousandth of an inch kind of tolerance. So, you know, you have to design a part that has it. I mean, because these things are literally inside of an engine, you're exploding, there's like many explosions. It's like, like these things, the, all these things going off and the different temperatures and things you can come across are just Im imperative with these sealing components. They were sealing components. So we were actually in the combustion chamber where our parts were. So anyway, just very detailed work and always transparent. I mean, you know, you're, when you're selling the Boeing and GE and Pratt Whitney, these places, obviously looking at everything you did throughout the process to make sure when they put into a, you know, F-18 or some kind of Raptor, you know, like, you know, that it's going to work and that the safety of our, um, of our military and even the public stuff, like the commercial stuff is intact. In so sure. that being said, that background really did lay the foundation and cannabis is the next one. And for me, I'll say I had a personal, let me wrap this story up for talking too much about this. So uh, I had like a You're personal uh, gap when I was in aerospace. I mean, I was like, I mean, when I went in nuclear power, uh, it was during Fukushima, uh, which is, I, I know, so I, I dealt with that and we had to deal with the same kind of plan for what we were doing and just kind of hearing the conversation sitting in the room with the board you know things i can't say but like the conversations i got exposed to because as a mailer just my boss was the top so like right. there was no like, it was him and me so at, at an age i got to see a lot and just like hearing those conversations i was like dang this is kind of raw and sad you know i thought i was you know like yeah sufficient it's clean air but it's a business you know and if something goes wrong they have a number of how much it costs to pay people and, and, and people die right like there's a number associated with life that I just first time hearing and being like oh this is real kind of blew my mind aerospace same deal um you know just really realizing all the war uh, just just really just having one of those like growing up moments you know what I mean sure I don't know. It's, it's one of those, it's one of those you're just dealing with like what is my purpose Right, 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 right. Yeah. Was having really intellectual satisfaction, but really just personally wasn't satisfied with what I was doing. I was coaching and doing a lot of community work at that time. So I was definitely fulfilling it and chasing it myself. I've coached Little League, high school, you know, Bubba Baltimore City, uh, inner city. I was definitely, I was tutoring. I was doing all these things trying to make up for what I felt like I was doing, but still wasn't quite that excited. And then right. cannabis came along and it was really like, okay, I can use my intelligence, my lab background, quality assurance, new industry. It's cannabis, like yeah. it's, just, it's California, LA. So that's really where, um, how I got here in the most detailed way I've ever explained it to someone. Besides the fact that me and Aaron Riley, our current CEO here, um, play college football together. So that's a story everyone hears a lot, but a lot of people don't really hear the part of where I was like, you know, where my quality assurance and everything comes from. That's something that really isn't known. Or got known. you. Did you say that you played college football together? Is that what you said? Yeah. So um, we were yeah. teammates. Uh, Aaron was about four years younger than me. So we. I graduated, he got kicked out for selling weed. He got a little early <laughs> entrepreneurship, you know, kind of had, I mean, like, you know. He was getting talking. early into the industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he got a license before they were giving him out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, but, you know, he ended up finishing up playing ball at uh, University of Jacksonville, getting his master's from there as well. So definitely came back around once sure. he did the entrepreneurial thing and saw me in a lab, identified a lab as a target for his cannabis reentry legally. And that's how the story really started. Um, we started burgeoning there, and then we came to Canada Safe. He bought it out, and got you. So, ever since, yeah. So that makes sense, like that that kind of growing up period, or or that that kind of you know end end road where you say, what kind of path do I want to take in my in my career, right? Because it didn't seem as fulfilling. You were you were being challenged intellectually, but kind of the end result was becoming a little too real, right? And yeah. And, and so That's when funny. you when you you found cannabis and you. Uh, and you started, I don't know what year that was, but I always ask this question when, when people transition to this industry. So from your background, very stringent, a lot of government regulations, like you said, a lot of accountability, transparency in these, in these plants. And then you move to a place like cannabis and, and I get like the lab space testing is very regulated as well, right? You're, he you're held to a standard by the state. Um, but 
the culture is different, right? So what what is it like? What are the differences, and what is you have you kind of experienced? Oh man, everything's different. I mean, even regulatory, yeah, it's tight. Like the lab is the tightest regulated um, in this part of the industry, but at the same time, it's not nearly regulated or it's not as standardized as you would like, even as a business operator. Some lot of inconsistency. Lots of um, opinions, so to speak, because uh, a lot of this stuff isn't standardized yet. So that's definitely frustrating and definitely challenging to any business. Uh, quite frank, it can be, it has been detrimental to several labs prior to us not being able to get openers to open due to some of this poor communication regulation that is our current system. Uh, but yeah. in addition to that, I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, like, I'm always used to the data speaking for itself or, you know, chasing what really matters because the material properties really make a difference, right? Like if you don't have this inside of it, it's not going to work, right? right. Um, we haven't gotten into cannabis, right? <laughs> We're working on it. People are chasing it right now. There's this THC chase, which is stupid. I was just say, quite frank, you know, everyone got these flowers jacked up over 30%. It's not what's therapeutic. <laughs> so once and, that's, we, we have- and that's in, you got to, that's in California, right? I mean, these legal states, everybody's ch- like you said, they're chasing that potency, the, the high levels of THC. And, uh, but then there's other, there's other states that aren't even medical. I mean, Texas, we're not even scratching the surface. So when you say that for other, other places, they're like, what do you mean by that? You know? So, but I, I totally get it. Like they yeah. want the highest amount of THC for some reason. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just a brand thing. People are, so, I mean, it's the same thing kind of people are equated to liquor. Oh, all of a sudden it's, it's more, it's just people, I mean, obviously it's tricky, right? Like to me, if you want high concentration stuff, you should be chasing concentrates. You know, that's what they're there for. You know, you, you can get that. You don't need to be trying to sneak a flower up that high, especially when you're losing the terpenes, you're losing all these other things that, that come with it. And honestly, those numbers aren't that true. I mean, that's just real. Like a lot of these numbers right now, we know from the last space kind of what's happening and what um, is attractive to people, right? I mean, people are literally selling flour for more money when the THC is higher. So it's a business thing. And it's a miseducation. If, if the consumer didn't care for it, it wouldn't matter, right? But you see when you go in dispensaries here, you know, that flour at 30 plus percent is priced literally a ten dollars higher per jar you know or something right. like that. so and, and then taxes on top of it and that's and you know what you made up so you brought up such a good point and that's one thing that when we really look at california and that chase for high potency you met you made a great point in that you're, you're missing out on the other secondary cannabinoids and, and the terpenes the flavonoids all the other stuff that provides that entourage effect that full spectrum effect which is inherently the best for your body right so no, it, it is it is and we already know that and that's what's different we know full spectrum is better than and isolate so it's like why are we doing it with i don't know it's just it's just unfortunately it's a brand chase and i get it because it's really hard to operate in california unfortunately the rules are not set out to be a you know uh medicine type giving business and that's the issue is that they really haven't allowed the markets to be whole the taxes are too expensive and people are having to do these things to survive i mean there's a lot of gut raiders out here who don't want to be in this tac chase but they're like hey i'm gonna lose my business if I don't, you know, it's some of the challenges that labs have that, you know, some of these small labs that unfortunately do some of these these things uh, that jeopardize consumer safety are doing it because they're, they're trying to make ends meet. And, you yeah. know, and it's nothing you can ever justify or ever uh, rectify. But, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a problem. And, um, you know, but you have other states. I've heard, like, Pennsylvania is really big on terpenes at the flower. I heard they don't even, like, talk about the THC levels. So, I mean, just if someone, to me, just have to get the right channel for the patient, and then the rest of the stuff, so be it. If it's a brand chase, whatever, let it go. Let it be. If you want to buy a Supreme, if you want to buy, you know, whatever, whatever maybe yeah. do your thing, whatever fits. Because there's going to have every consumer, right? You're going to have the Walmart cannabis. You're going you're gonna to have these levels eventually, right? It's just how our consumer society breaks down. So it's going to happen to us. Yeah. But it's like, don't jeopardize the patient's ability to get medicine um, with this. And that's my frustration is that there's people out here who have um, come to California and been able to, you know, get access to this medicine, the Prop 215 error, you know, even safe medicine too, even before testing was required, people were doing it right. Now they can't afford it. So it's just, that's, that's my frustration um, that I yeah. have with the, with the industry is the patient is really the loser right now in this uh, yeah. in market. Well, and it seems like um, with the lack of federal regulation, there's these unintended consequences where, of course, the states are the ones that are that are deciding whether they want to become adult use, medical, whatever, right? But it's interesting how you see consumers gravitating toward different aspects of the plant, given the current market of that state and their their level of of understanding of the plant right so yeah. like you yeah. take a you take a state like pennsylvania like you just mentioned which is not adult use I, I don't even i'm not sure if they're medical but 
I, I think it's medical or something. I, I, I think it's medical. It's medical, but with the with the farm bill being you know passed and and you know mass amounts of hemp being able to be cultivated now state by state, you're seeing people drawn to the plant from the the hemp side and their understanding about terpenes, and so they're becoming gravitated to that. They're learning about those, and there's not that hyper focus. Uh, no. For THC, you know, where you see in California where it's always been THC, right? No, <laughs> exactly. And that's because they're newer to the market and, 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 and they're not chasing those same things. Just like you said, they're looking for, you know, more of a um, therapeutic effect because they're there for cannabis. Yeah. So they have a medical, it's, it's a medical for programming PA. I mean, so those are kind of things that you're going to see over time. And like you said, without federal regulation, with all the money and research, think about it, the National Institute of Health, whatever, old mess where everyone talks about that crappy weed. I know. Their right? goal <laughs> isn't there to talk about their peace. They're there to see what the harm of cannabis can be. So they've been spending all this money chasing harm that they haven't found in it, you know, and they haven't yeah. spent any money trying to figure out the benefits of it. And that's where we're saying, thank God now, because they just passed a bill to get more cannabis available for research so doctors can start declaring more. I mean, I just saw a great... Uh, presentation. Um, uh, I know Dr. Ziva Cooper from UCLA was on. I can't think of was it was the FDA I was watching or USDA. I can't, I can't recall now, unfortunately. But it was just an update of kind of everything going on. There's so much research. Even at Hopkins had some research in Baltimore, which wow. is cool to see that they're doing these studies, they're doing these medical studies, and, and, and they're showing things like you said. They're confirming that full spectrum is better. They're confirming that, um, you know, that some of these things aren't addicting. I mean, they're, they're, they're really confirming the things that we already knew as like cannabis people, which is why education is so important. It's really strange that California doesn't have an educational requirement to be a caregiver, right? You know, like for, to me, there's other states that have better rules where, hey, like if you're going to be a caregiver, if you're going to administer medical cannabis, you should have education to understand, you know, the benefits, what's important, which type of matrices are important, why vaping is such an important delivery method for sick people, you know, like all these things that really need to be understood in order to have a more um, effective and efficient market. Yeah, and that's what we're chasing. And we're hoping to provide data to, right? Because we're not doctors here. So we're working with, only if you, go, you can go to our website and see we have a physician's corner. We have a healthcare advocate, uh, Miko um, Perez. I mean, she's just amazing. First of all, um, you should check out her story. Uh, and she's really brought that medical community into what we do. We're providing data that they've been looking for. So that's the connection for us, right? Like we're not right. here to diagnose. We're not here to produce. We're here to help profile. So these doctors can then make these diagnoses and help people, you know, get better, safer, more consistent experience as well. Yeah, no, that that's great. And I would, I'd love to um, talk with that doctor that you mentioned, um, if she'd be willing to come on, maybe you can make that intro. That'd be awesome. Uh, but, you know, Antonio, I want to talk about like some, some trends that you're seeing from a lab uh, testing perspective, right? So let's sure. first kind of talk about some, some of the challenges. Um, you mentioned earlier about, you know, the, the issue of lab shopping and um, some of these labs kind of issuing potency levels that may not be exactly what they're testing out at, right? Mm -hmm. So um, talk about like, you know, the, the, pr the prevalence of that you know, and, and if it, you know, the issue there, and then maybe some other challenge that you're seeing. Yeah, so the prevalence of potency shopping, I mean, you see it as a lab in Washington that just got shut down, Washington State for falsifying potency results. I think Oregon has had a similar study where they've identified, you know, some labs reporting like 20 to, you know, whatever percent higher than the other, you know, um, in the other, you know, aggregated data. Uh, California has already been data out there, you know, showing this is happening. Uh, no one's publicized it. There's some, there's a UC Berkeley study that we took part in, you know, to show just how these numbers are really inconsistent. And I'm not saying everyone is doing it wrong, just doing things um, to push it higher. Some people are just wrong because they can't extract this stuff well, or they don't, you know, they don't take the time or they don't really understand the matrix of all, all these things. Well, or the, not. or the equipment, right? Maybe the equipment's exactly. outdated. It's, yeah. it's expensive, it's outdated. They're not seeing things at the levels like California. You have to look at things for parts per billion. So we have these very sensitive instruments and honestly some of the rules even the regulators have admitted aren't you know are almost too stringent but right now that's where we're that's the challenge what we're operating under and then without the ability for these labs um these regulators to go into labs and see things in person there's just so many different opportunities for miscommunication and uh, issues and things that we've dealt with here um quite frankly and it's um it is a challenge so i guess i'm not gonna say lab shopping i'm, I'm not sorry i'm not I'm gonna say potency inflation is um the number one thing or like, you know, it happens all the time, but I mean, you, you'll see it. I mean, I, I, 
honestly, when you go see someone saying granddaddy purpose, like 28%, you could probably challenge it. But that's the education of knowing some of these strains, these lemonades, and some of these, you know, very nice, uh, very tasty, very therapeutic type strains. They're not necessarily represent, like, you know, when you know enough, you'll be like, huh, that's, that's, that's weird seeing that so high. But for the average consumer, there's no, I mean, your guy you've been buying weed from out of a Ziploc hasn't given you THC numbers for the last 20 years, right? So, you, don't right. Really know, <laughs> you know, you haven't really had this conversation before now. And, and it really, true. if you see a really nice branded product and they say I'm 30% plus, you're like, holy shit, that's what I really want, you know, yeah. because they tell you that and you, and, and you believe it. And, you know, and that's what consumerism is. And it's really easy to sell something without, you know, <laughs> without it being true. I mean, I don't know. I mean, let's just, I mean, it's, it's a basic conversation. I mean, it is what our country, I, I don't know. It's, it, it is kind of, you have to expect this if you understand con consumerism. And right. kind of, this right. is really just, we're just doing what we do almost in a sense, right? This is like, we roll would, with it. Yeah. Whatever's working, like, why stop there, right? Just continue with what's working is kind of the No matter mindset. how true it is, it's working. You're able to, make your money you're able to pay these crazy ass taxes california has also excuse my guts in there and you know then all of a sudden you think that's the new business model because you're successful you get a leg up and like you said it can be misleading but it is like it's working and as yeah. a business you're doing everything you can to max your profit otherwise like no one else gives a crap about you the the, the customer doesn't care that you're not making money right you know? and, and you know, and out, outside of the malicious activity, like actually inflating the potency levels, like we talked about, um, like outside of those, those acts that are direct in, in, in maliciousness, you know, there's other consequences. Like you said, if it's working with the THC gravitation in California, it's because it's working. It's, it's been one of the legacy States that was first to go adult use. Right. So yeah. it's, and, and without, and I, I know I keep saying this, but like without that regulation at the federal level, like these States are literally just going to kind of form their uh -huh. own exactly. organisms and ecosystems because there's no oversight, you know, exactly. it's all patchwork and it's it's not good and you know yeah and, and yeah it's a lot of it's silly i mean honestly i think you know between oregon florida you know C C colorado no sorry oregon california colorado all these western states can honestly supply the majority of it. like you don't need to be setting up an indoor grow and you know somewhere in the south where you got to pull all this humidity out of the air it's gonna be so expensive it's like why are you doing this when you could easily open up interstate commerce and allow this market i mean the, the traditional market in california is kicking everyone's ass if, I don't know if you're not um, aware, but like the, the the traditional market is still three or four times the size of the legal one here, and it's not slowing down anytime soon. So right. why not give these people an opportunity that are already producing the stuff that are already making it? Give them opportunity to actually enter the market. Don't make these rules so crazy in California. Potentially be a leader. I mean, Oregon, I think Oregon is pushing for interstate commerce more than anyone because they had that um, surplus because they've set up a pretty good system. Right. Yeah. Oh. There's, there's so many, I mean, and we all know it, like people, like plant, the people of the plant know, like, you know, the benefits, right? Whether it's an economic benefit, a medicinal benefit, uh, an environmental benefit, but it's just so frustrating. We're at this point, but it's, it's almost good timing with the pandemic because it really starts to elevate the voices in the industry to really speak out on these issues and, and talk about how they could help, you know, with, with economic recovery, with environmental sustainability, like, you know, medicinal uh, alternative medicines, right. Outside mm -hmm. of the pain management stuff that we're used to. So it just takes the leaders at the top, these policymakers to at least be open to listening, you know, at this point. And yeah, well, I, I will say that too, because I've been working in legislation for some time in these last four years. Honestly, we don't speak up enough. I mean, we don't speak up. I mean, so a lot of these legislators, they're very thankful when you show up, but a lot of people aren't showing up, one, and then two, when they show up, they aren't doing these things that like you're talking about. They're doing things for their business. You know, they're actually trying to get some of these rules. Back. Like, look at the CBD industry. They're trying so hard to allow for CBD products without any testing on final products. And it's like, this is the same plant as marijuana. You have all this testing required for cannabis and now you're allowing the cbd industry to come in on at, at walmart at walgreens right. or cbs at whole foods and put this stuff in front of your grandma and this stuff is either mislabeled and has nothing in it which all these studies have shown even the you know uh you know like all these law i'm sorry health journals have even published data now where it's like uh yeah the cbd is mislabeled it's not it doesn't exist in this bottle and you know they're taking a one dollar bottle of water which will actually should probably be a two cent bottle of water to begin with because it's water <laughs> it should be free yeah. and open to everyone but two, <laughs> they make it ten dollars because they, they, they call it freaking cbd and there's nothing in there or it's not processed well or it's all separated it's just 
it's just poor. Like, why are you not putting the same regulation requirements on, you know, CBD market that you are for the cannabis market? We're talking right. About and I, I can't tell you how many people that I've met that are like, no, nah, CBD does work. I, I've tried it. It doesn't do anything for me. It's not, you know, and, and it's because of those products that they're testing and trying, you know, and they're, well, they're not coming people. back. You know? Yeah, yeah, they're going to the gas station picking up CBD, or it's like, what are you like? You know, this is a cannabinoid. I know it's, it's just like this should be, but it should be in some type of, I don't say dispensary, some type of medicine. Like there should be a place where someone you can go as educate to teach you about this stuff. And you can get it affordable. Like that's the problem. Like you said, there's no system set up right now to make it easy because there's no federal system demanding it. Right? If the feds right. demanded a network, an ecosystem, we would have one, and there'd be places would be available. You would know where the good, where the bad is, but. Until the feds get involved, unfortunately, America doesn't comprehend well enough yeah. how to navigate this issue. And it's going to be a unique, it's going to be a case-by-case -case issue until there's enough things that we understand as a community to agree upon it. And that's where I think California has an opportunity to lay this out. We work with people all the time. I was talking about Miko. I mean, we have a um, CSR partner, uh, the Social Impact Center based in the Valley here, who do this work, who deal with the community, who help these sensitive help these, um, these very sensitive communities, whether it be uh, people with disabilities, LGBTQ, all these sensitive communities who need access to cannabis, who use it, uh, you know, quite well, but they don't have anyone to come to talk to them. They don't have anyone helping them get it, you know, and it's really mm -hmm. a shame when you really, I mean, I really enjoy the work that we do uh, outside of the lab and the community, but it's really frustrating when you realize thing, like there's no one else here trying to get this stuff done. There's no one trying to help people get their records expunged. There's no one else out here trying to educate kids on the opportunities and the jobs available in this industry. There's no, you know, college forums. You know, it's, it's like we're like we, we, we go to these um, we get invited to college fairs sometimes because we're um, a laboratory. And it's almost like we can't talk about that we're in cannabis at the same time. It's like, yeah, you can come up, but don't but don't kind of encourage what you do. It's like, but that's what I do though. I talk about, <laughs> like, well, you can't talk about cannabis on campus. It's like, talk about like, talk I about mean. talk about feeling welcome, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. don't have to try and check a box almost, and they're not really. They say, you know, when society isn't set up for you, you feel it. Um, you know, especially like someone myself that's grew up in the South and grew up around this kind of drug thing. You know how the police are. We know we're not really feel welcome. That's kind of what you feel. Yeah. When you go into the cannabis industry, I think that's why the cannabis industry does do a lot for the community because they actually become a minority. You know, whether you grew up affluent or not, even as a white person, you enter this industry, a stigma comes with it. Mm -hmm. But I think although you maybe can't equate the two, you feel something you've never felt before. And that forges a community approach, right? It forges you to say, well, screw these other people. And then you don't work with them. You know, so it's just like this weird primal I oh, don't know, cyclical thing that we're going through to, until we, like you said, get a federal layout yeah. of and steps in. We're going to have these people kind of closing ourselves off them and that we're so unique and we're so, we're essential. You know, Newsom says we're essential. So we, you know, we're, we're special. But it's like, what does that mean? You're not getting paid more. You know, it's just, you're not, you're not able to write off your tax deductions. You know, you're not, and like, I can't get a PPP loan. Yeah. I, I mean, right. I mean, think about I me mean, like we're fortunate enough to have a, a lab, but like I know so many great cannabis companies who don't have a payroll. They can't afford it. It's the wife, the husband and their cousin and maybe one person that they pay on the side. Like, they, they, they can't afford to run a payroll. So right. now you have to give them a loan that's based on their ability to run payroll. I mean, that's pre I mean, that's prejudice. I mean, you can even call it racist if you want. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, like it's, it's like, come on, you know, the people that you're dealing with, you know, they don't have these traditional things set up. And you're pretty much just setting up a, you know, the trap. They call it the game for a reason because half the things that they lay out, you can't qualify for. You don't know how to qualify for it. I mean, it's really scary how easy it is to get someone's record expunged and how cheap it can be too and how little many people are really trying to help people get that done. I mean, we're very, I'm, I'm so glad that we did the work with uh, Felicia and Social Impact Center this year with National Expungement Week, just seeing how many people are just thankful. Brown, black, white, old. I mean, just like, wow, like I've had this on my record for 20 years. I've dealt with this for 20 years. It's crazy. And in this, you know, hour and a half, you guys just helped me for free get this alleviated. People are like in tears. They're emotional because like they've been walking around with this stigma for 20 years, can't get a job, eventually, you know, housing is a trouble. All these things are a trouble then. They're like, wow, this is available to me. Like, someone helped me get this done. Like, thank you. And it's like literally the most rewarding thing, yeah, um, that we do here. And at least that I feel like we do here because it's a true. You change someone's life when you do stuff like that, right? I mean, like, this is bigger than us, you know, making money or bigger than us testing. Sure. Uh,
cannabis and change and, someone's life. And, and it needs to be, it needs to be the a priority, right? As this in- industry is so new and it's it's just kind of starting to form itself, right? It, it it needs to be a priority to undo those wrongs for those people who have been incarcerated for nonviolent cannabis related crimes, whatever, you know, whatever yeah. it is related to cannabis, it needs to be looked at because we can't forget about that group of people because they're the backbone of kind of how this thing and this wave is get, is, has got going, Scary. you know what I mean? The traditional market is only here because people have taken that burden upon, lost their children, been locked up for, I mean, grand was taking on time. Taking on the scrutiny from their peers, right? All that and stuff. Those yeah. are the people that I think have to be rewarded. I mean, I'm not saying they have to own every business, but they have to be, there has to be some type of, like you said, it's not for reparation. Whatever you want to call it, there has to be yeah. something there for all communities. I'm not saying that's the black and brown for everyone. Obviously, the war on drugs did target certain communities more more often than such. I mean, the numbers are there. You can't deny that. But it doesn't mean that, you know, only certain people should benefit from this. This has to be a better structure. I mean, just, just like you said, like, I don't think people, not like you said, but like, I don't think people would mind these taxes as much if they knew these taxes were going towards those things. I think mm-hmm. people would honestly, the legal market could take a pretty big boost if people understood that their taxes were going towards these communities. I think people would do some kind of, you know, some kind of guilt uh, transactions. I, mean, I think people will want to help. People would be, is cannabis already? And then knowing that their tax money is going really towards those communities. I think there's an opportunity for federal and state governments to really, like you said, correct some of the bs that was done but unfortunately we don't have the best system for equity so no. like, you know, i don't think anyone's done it right or even close to right quite yet right i mean i, I want to give out uh, another california company a shout out sam uh, ariano has been on the podcast from candescent and they huh? mentioned how they are launched their justice joints, justice joints. yeah yeah we some of those for them as well yeah that's so awesome. Yeah, yeah. So for those listening, if you're not if you don't know what that is, and correct if I'm wrong, Antonio, but basically they're joints and hundred percent of the proceeds go to the Last Prisoner Project and other right. social equity programs. Right. Um yeah. No, so, it's really exciting. The Last Prisoner Project is doing good work. They have a few brands doing things like that for them, creating these these lines or you want to call it these cues that are more targeted, which is I think amazing. So you know, like definitely kudos to, to them for doing such one of our partners here in California. And yeah, that kind of stuff is the work that just needs to be done. I mean, mm-hmm. if you would really expect to be here and be supported by the people, especially just, it just needs to be done. It's, it's overdue. And um, there's no sense, you know, like kind of fighting it, so to speak, right? There's, there's no sense and that's not acknowledging this work and what it needs to be done. The impact they can do. I mean, the lives that can change, the people that have opportunity to speak up, these bright, intelligent people that are in these communities that haven't had the same opportunity um, that a lot of people have, and for generations, I mean, just think about the generations of people that unfortunately have been overlooked right. or a miscast due to the stigma or due to their not having the parent that got locked. You know, it's just people just don't, the people don't really want to appreciate how easy it is to get your life thrown off until it happens to someone they know or themselves, right? It's just almost like the, um, the silliness with homosexuality. It's like, oh, I know a gay person now, and it's, it's all okay. It's like, what? Like, <laughs> what took so long? And like, why did you have to find someone to appreciate? But it's a human, it's a human fallacy, right? I, I, I'm not sorry if anyone I offended with that, with that comment, but I'm no, it's like, like if, it, if it doesn't affect you, you're not thinking that, about it. Yeah, right? It's just so unfortunate. And, yeah. and, and I unfortunately was a victim of such until like, I did experience more. Luckily, I went to my parents spent a lot of money me going to private school and meeting a lot of different people that didn't look like me and from different parts of the world. And I was kind of like, whoa, this is really dope. You know, there's more <laughs> to, uh, you know, all these different people. I mean, like, unfortunately, I mean, there's so many different misnomers from the South I could speak on. I don't want to sound ignorant, but I mean, like, you know, like just understanding that there's these, there's just people from right. different places. And, you know, if we really can, I don't know, it's just, it's just really sad sometimes when I think about some of the things I grew up not understanding or not appreciating until you really challenge, even moving to LA, it's just like, wow, like there's so much culture and um, life lessons and things to be avoided and better practices, you know, if we be, just talk to each other a little bit more, you know, I mean, that's why this global economy, I think is so important. I mean, I think we're moving there. I think we're saying we have to depend on people, this war stuff, it's just like people were saying the wars are benefiting only a few, not all of us. I think it's gonna happen. I think our kids and grandkids are gonna live a little bit differently for sure. Yeah, it's going to be a different world for sure. I mean, yeah. um, you know, even when I was in college, right, we, we learned about the emergence of globalization and, exactly. you it's, know, and it's it's something that we know is probably inevitable. Um, 
but I just don't know. You know, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know. I don't know what. what that's the scary uh, part, yeah. right? No one really know. gets it. Yeah. We know it has to happen, but yeah, and that's what's going to get ugly. Probably it's going to get messier, but eventually it's going to. That's what's going to come out of it. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to survive anyway. So it's just like resources are getting scarce. People aren't getting this stuff. I mean, like. I mean, who says? I mean, 80 years, freaking parts of Arizona and stuff may not be habitable anymore. You know, it's going to be so hard. You're going to have these global warming zones where, like, electric people are going to desert them. Like, and, and, we're going to we're going to occupy Mars. What do you mean? We're just going to leave Earth and live on another planet. That's that's that, the plan. That might be a long the answer. I mean, like, I mean, like, this, I mean, like, at some point, we're going to have to find like there's going to be, you know, these pockets of inhabitability just simply because of what's happening to our Earth and people don't can't. I don't know people think, oh, it's, it's, it's like Mad Max. I'm like, yeah, it's going to kind of maybe well, be something. Like which that. is why we need to grow more hemp. We need to grow more hemp. It can help. It can solve something. And that's what people are, that's what I'm saying. We're going to get to these places. Whether we people see it right now, how it works or not, we're going to get to these places where hemp is going to become much more prominent again as a natural resource. I mean, it's just going to, it's cyclical, man. I mean, like, whether it be our lifetime or not, it's all going to shake itself out. The earth is not going to be the loser in all this. We are. I mean, like, that's yeah. going to realize that and the earth is going to figure itself out and we might not just be a part of that next step. <laughs> right. And what's that saying? I, I'm probably butchering it, but it's like no human action or no human behavior um, has has um, been hidden under the sun. So like, basically it's all been, it's been done. You know what I mean? And in some form, obviously technology is new and that's always evolving and changing, but you know, we, we kind of repeat human behaviors you know society the the groups. i mean that's and, and, yeah and that's the reality i mean i don't want to sound like a, i don't know i don't know how i don't, I don't, I don't mean to have some like heady conversation or sound like you know we're all doomed and be all drab and emo or anything but it's just like one of those things as you grow and have these maturation moments now for me in business and learning these challenges and learning on this new industry and saying that you know no matter how hard you try to do it right you do have attacks on your character and you know, it's, it's, it's just been such an eye-opening experience for, for me and for and, and what I'll say here, I don't know if we have to end it sometime soon, but I'm enjoying the conversation, but yeah. like, is that the purpose, the, the real, real big thing that really is important for me is trying to change, just trying to change the world somehow with this. I mean, like whether we make a bunch of money, knowing that the thing we're doing in the community, knowing the lives that we can impact, I mean, knowing the people that we're working with that are already in the community, committing their lives to this, being able to support their work, I think is what I really want to be able to walk away from is being able to say that can I say for Antonio and Aaron's the same way where whatever we're doing we absolutely want to be able to say that we help create a CSR structure a, a corporate social responsibility for a business to actually make a difference and that's what we're really trying to figure out at the end of the day it's like how do we make money I mean you see the damn price guy in Seattle that does like the 70k for all his employees or something I don't know if you follow that guy on Instagram no. or not, but like he's this really cool guy's the CEO I think his name is Dan Price I follow him on Instagram I mean he's a little a little tough for me to always get on board with, but I get where it's coming from, right? You know, it's kind of like the whole burn. I don't know, it's an interesting guy. You should check, check the story out. I think he gave everyone a minimum salary of 60K or 70K like um, four or five years ago. And um, even through all that, like the home ownership of his employees went up. People were more committed. You know, he did one of those really unique workplaces where like, I'm committing to you. I'm cutting my salary because I know how much I'm investing into you. And I know eventually I'll make all this money back if I get you to a place, like not by society standard for what I should pay you, but by what you can live by, right? And right. It's like this mind blowing social experiment that's going really well. Yeah, your, 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 best, your best capital is human capital, right? I mean- and that's, that's what he really dove into and it's really setting a new standard obviously i'm not saying it's applicable in every single industry but it's really unique the risk that he took and the money that he probably hasn't seen simply because he did this and seeing the roi and and the attention it's getting and people are looking for something man i mean let's keep it real Healthcare is scarce people finally understand after all these generations how important healthcare is and the fact that it's tied to your job is a real big uh yeah. I'll say ball and chain, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's a real big decision maker for people. You think about the fact that healthcare is tied to your employment, it makes you not make, you know, you don't take as many risks, you know, you know, you kind of behave, so to speak, right? Because you're so true. About the healthcare. So you know, true. It's a, yep. It's such one of those degrees of freedom that we don't even realize is available to us because we're so taught that healthcare comes from your job and therefore you must keep a good job because that's how you get taken care of. And I hate that. I hate that mentality. I mean, I hate that outlook or, or the way that's been because it, it just drives I'm, me crazy. I mean, everyone has it, but I, yeah. I want to say, I mean, I got kids and a lot of people feel that way. You know, I, I'm not saying. No, no, no. I, I'm saying, I'm from... saying you're, I'm saying you're right in the oh, fact okay. that if okay. you have kids okay. and you have dependables, of course you got to do what it takes. Let me clarify. I'm not, I'm just saying, I hate that that's the way it is. I hate that that's the situation. Yeah. You know, I yeah. don't like yeah. that. 
yeah. And like I said, I mean, some people benefit from that. Some people don't. Some people find the good medium spot. So I'm not saying it's evil and every company is evil for doing that, but it's obviously a part of um, this ecosystem that we're living in. It's, and it's something that I think is scary because like you said, people don't really consciously think about that. They don't really think about the fact of how tied in they are and how they shouldn't have to be when you're seeing the stimulus amounts of money that we can come up with, uh, you know, when you're seeing these things happen, you're kind of like, huh, how come, you know, when you're seeing the stats about the billionaires getting 25% richer, if they like, you know, tax themselves, they could pay for all this, just kind of like, wow, like that's a thing that could happen and it doesn't happen. And, um, you know, I'm not trying to, I'm not like, I'm not some super socialist here. So please, uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to get political, but you know, people are having these conversations and I think, if you ignore that, you'll have a problem. If you listen and you try to figure out the best way, that's what we're trying to do at Karen's like, for listening. Okay, what do you guys need? Okay. Like, yeah. If, if you're more interested in 401k than, um, you know, and benefits and us paying for more, then we're going to cut out free lunch. That's what we did. You know, there's same things that we, we gave and take, like, hey, like the free lunch thing is cool, but we could pay, we could give you some more on your points. And people are like, yeah, I'd rather have a higher percent of my health insurance coverage. So, something that, right. that we made didn't go over well for everybody, but that's something that we were trying to figure out. I'm not saying it was a, game changer or the best move in the world but we were trying to figure out we were listening right you know and trying to figure out what do you really need to feel whole um and to feel like you know this job is the best place you know it's, it has your best interest in mind well, obviously we have to make money we can't you know you know go red trying to make everyone's life cushy but we're trying our best to be like hey like we're trying to commit to our, our employees right. and it's just a and, conversation right and, and that's what i hear in california obviously if i was in tennessee i don't think i'd be hearing as much of this stuff uh, but right. being in la you definitely hear some different type of um, perspective and a lot of different perspectives from different countries and you know yeah all kinds of different people and societies or where they come from and how they uh do these things and it's really for me i really enjoy um hearing a lot of that and trying my best to take into account not saying we do a great job I'm not sure. saying that safe is like some freaking you know zen <laughs> it's not you guys like, got oh, bean, you guys got bean bags all over yeah your it's, not, and, uh, it's not yoga yeah. at 3 p.m or anything no but uh <laughs> but i mean we're certainly trying our best to make a lab as you know as cool as a lab can be but thank sure. you it's still, it's still a lab though no, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, it's 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 important to have that top of mind when operating a business because, as we talked about, human capital is important. You know that the people that you're hiring um, are the best suited for that job, and you know that they're going to make returns if they're doing their job and doing it correctly, right? So you want to reward them. You want to make the environment comfortable and uh, and make it a place where they're happy to go to work every day, right? Because ultimately, spending more time at work is a full-time job than you are with your family in, in most situations. So, Oh, yeah. I mean, no, 100%. And we've gone through the lesson of losing that in there, right? I mean, we've gone through the turnover due to the fact of not taking care of the people and losing sight of it and whatnot. So we've seen these different rates. We've been through it. I'm not, I got to say, I'm not saying things are sitting here resenting out here. We certainly have had some turmoil periods where you're like, holy crap, like, why is everyone so pissed off? You're like, you know, like... You know, like what what happened? I was, you know, I I, got, I went on the road for a month. And I come back, everyone's mad as hell. It's like, whoa, what did we do, and what and where did we miss out? Like, what did we do as leaders to make sure we stepped out of the lab that people still bought in? You know, how did we not bridge that gap? How did we not foresee that people would not, uh, you know, feel the same way right. when someone else was given the the daily updates? You know, like why? Mm -hmm. Like where did where did where did we miss? You know, like and, and that's how you have to look at things. Otherwise, you're gonna be pointing a finger and you're not gonna get anything done. Right. Because you know it's no one's job but yours. You know, you can't say, oh, that person is a bad hire. It's like, well, you hired them, asshole. You know, so like <laughs> so it's not like you know, like what are you gonna do to take care of your people better if you hired a bad leader, then that's your fault. You know, right. that's one of the things that we took a long time to do is that sometimes you know, if people, you know, you have to realize what's important. You know, you can always get, get technical, you can get leadership, you can get social, you know, you can get all these different qualities out of a leader. You really have to understand if you want to be a business owner or true, you know, out there like which ones have to be there and which ones are nice to have or on all of them, you know, you really have to put some hard barriers around, hey, how much am I going to tolerate someone missing this box? Right, and right. Obviously, the quicker you make a decision, the normally the better off you're going to be if you're really feeling something. A lot of times people don't change. I mean, you get people, you know, have been doing things for some time. You're not going to, you know, you can teach someone a different skill, but you can't teach someone to be a different person. 
Right. Right. They're inherently going to be who they are. So it's managing those expectations and making sure that they know from the get go so that, you know, you can address those problems. But not a year them. into it, you know, complaining yeah. about you talk to somebody. That shouldn't be something that you're a year into. You know, you should be as a leader on top of that stuff, making sure, you know, whether you want to allow, you know, like just, just making those decisions, you know, not allowing someone to maybe disrupt what you're building or the culture. That's one thing I would give a, a CEO or someone starting out in a startup like, hey, you need to dictate your people that you're most like you said your most valuable asset you need to make sure they're taken care of if you allow people will always feel when you lose sight of them that's one thing right. that they'll see it way before you do and they'll feel it <laughs> way before you even notice that they're pissed off so that's one thing that we've learned is that you got to take care of your people otherwise you will have some major disruption we've been through different waves of it you know most companies have right they, sure, they don't want sure. to they don't want to talk about it but right I'm, it happens all the time, man. Yeah, that's business. I mean, that's that's running a company. Uh, but it's good that you guys have that, you know, a top of mind. And um, Antonio, before we wrap up, I want to ask you one one question, one more question. That is like, so what what is um, you know upcoming for Canasafe in two thousand twenty one? What's the outlook? What do you guys have uh, in terms of priorities in the new year? Priorities. I mean, so for us. Um... Yeah, uh, for I'm trying to think of a few, there's a few things on for Canada Safe. So Canada Safe as a business, where obviously there's a like I said, the brand chases out there. There are three times as many lives. We're trying to get back to a more of a lion's share type position, right? We're doing everything we can, to, you know, to to always gain more of the market. So we definitely got some things upcoming for us to uh, hopefully reassert ourselves uh, in a little bit larger of a fashion. Some customer service things, some next steps, some. Um, some networking things that we're going to do for our clients that we're going to you know, be able to help everyone kind of survive. Like you said, we're trying to create a network. One of the things I'm personally excited about, so selfishly, what I want to talk about is that uh, in 2021, we are looking uh, as Canada Safe and through our partners, through our CSR, through, um, you know, ASA, I'm on the board for Americans for Safe Access as well. It's a big part of what I do. Um, industry organization management advocating for patients' rights for the get-go. Steph Scherer is just an amazing woman and really was an inspiration to me coming into the industry. Someone else you should have on at, 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 at some point. I think she has a lot of knowledge. She's seen this whole thing from his infancy. Uh, yeah, I'd love to. Like San Fran, we know. Yeah, she's been here from the get go. So anyway, that being said, um, want to put forth some legislation to require some education for caregivers and for um, California operators. I mean, not really sure how hard we're going to push it right now, but there should be some level of education requirements. Some, we well, you know there's all these good programs. I heard you got Oaksha Dam. ASA has a program. Uh, we have something that we do for our own clients. There's so many good people putting forth good cannabis focused education to get people who are administering this medicine to understand it better. And like you said, guide them towards the things that matter. So hopefully when Texas does come online, they can look at a better program to actually feel more comfortable with. Some of these red states where I know I'm from and I grew up, they, I mean, Florida actually does a pretty good job because they, they're, they're a little conservative is that they, they're looking for data. They don't want to just make, open it up, right? Like right. they understand what's going on. And this is the best way to give it to them. So like, so what we're trying to do is fill in the few gaps of California, which I think is just having a true education program, having a natural way to BCC starting to give out grants for education, but it's like, what are we moving towards? Like I see all these different presentations and all these money has been allotted to things, but none of those grant awards were things that's gonna allow the industry to separate itself from the illicit market. They were all about research or I'm not, I'm saying bad stuff, but more about like sure, sure. the societal impact and what does it do for the illicit market? Or what is, it's like, yeah, that's good information and it's important. But if we're actually trying to allow this industry to stand up and squash the illicit market, what are you doing to educate people mm -hmm. so they understand why it's important? What are you doing to make sure the operators in your legal system are above ground? You know, what are you really doing to ensure that the patients are um, secure in all of this and they have access and affordable access throughout all of this. And that's what we think the education can do. It can really absolutely deter, encourage regulators. It'll give regulators even a pinpoint of entry point. The ones that are conservative want something like this. They're asking mm -hmm. us for yeah, it, 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 it provides I, it provides that direct line of communication between two parties too. I mean now they can actually work together and start, you know, implementing some legislation that that tackles these issues. Right? Exactly. Because yeah. if you educate it's, it's just the first step. The first conversation can't always be about give me a license. It can be about well let me tell you what this does for your community because the education will come with the fact that hey whether you like it or not there's an illicit delivery in your neighborhood and all these kids or people can get access to it you know like um there was a great thing that used to be a did another organization we're part of they 
they did like a, um, they put like a vape dump container at a high school. And it was amazing how many kids had vape carts. It was like an exchange kind of thing. It was not an exchange, but it was like, um, just like, uh, it was just incredible. Like, 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 but, with the, like making sure that that vape had like not vitamin E acetate or yeah, they, they were like testing. That. They were saying, put your vapes in here. We'll get them like, they will get them tested. They actually did an exchange at a dispensary of like giving the legal wow. you know, industry buy. So that was a good, but the high school thing was just, Hey, like you shouldn't have this stuff. Like it can be dangerous. And just the amount of stuff that was collected. I mean, even for us, when we were doing the vape gate, talking to San Francisco, like, uh, sorry going to Sacramento with the governor's office was like it was a middle it was probably middle school like vapes I mean it was most like e-figs and stuff but it was like middle school kids were vaping I mean you just naively don't think that there's these problems at that age right. but if you don't have the education to separate the two right like if we don't separate the fact that e-cig flavor attack and the list of cannabis thing are two different problems I mean they're problems but not the same one no not and, at all yeah and that was a big issue one of the things that we were able to do with the vape gate was you know on NBC was do that we separate the hey the issue that we're seeing is related to an illicit market property of vitamin e acetate it's not an illegal market it's not even the e-cig thing you know there's def definitely flavor issues over there but what, 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 what we're dealing with is a reaction to a bad cut. I mean, it's yeah. almost something to think about. It's, it's a drug. It was. It's a bad cut. Someone yeah. like it's like a Yeah, cut. Like, I'm so dude. I'm so glad that you made that distinction and really kind of honed in on that because I was getting so frustrated reading articles about vape gate. You know, watching the news or even talking to my parents. It's like they they clumped in e-cigs and vapes Every. into one, and it's like Every no, thing, you don't even dude. know what you're like. You know. So, <laughs> Like it was, I'm glad that at, at your level, the one being commissioned to do that NBC report focused on that uh, also, because that's important for the industry, you know, that distinction. Yeah. And kudos yeah. to NBC, because you're right, they commissioned that. I mean, they did their due diligence. They searched for labs they thought they could trust. They talked to several labs. We, we honestly won the bid, but that was their, I mean, we had some research we were doing ourselves, but that was their idea to go, you know, randomly buy legal versus illicit and show the differences. I mean, obviously we were all a little, not nervous, but uh, we were all yeah. just like, Hoping the legal the legal, the legal market was correct, and fortunately, like it was supposed to be, it was free of pesticides, it was free of vitamin acetate, so it was good, right? But it was obviously for us kind of like a shit. Let's hope that what they purchased legally also ranks true. We had an idea of vitamin acetate, never did we think it'd be as bad as it was once we bought enough of the illicit stuff because we had had a few things come in, right? We see like, dang, there's a lot of junk in here, but then we actually went and did like batch testing when you know we had literally an illicit delivery show up to our lab with a bunch of like free stuff dude was trying to party he's like hey dude we bought, bought like 30 vape cars like what's going on in here was there you guys having a party can i show up we're like <laughs> we're like dude get out of here right I, you know like i can't tell you how many pens in dallas like buddies that i have or whatever you know they they'd have it and you would just see even ones that i would buy in the past turn black i couldn't even use it anymore because it just didn't look yeah. right and then some people were like man my chest is really hurt like there was like some after effects so i was like okay you get headaches. yeah yeah oh, seriously. and that's what you're dealing with i mean you're seeing the, it's just fortunately because you see enough and you look at it you know you you, you took a caution you're like whoa like what's going on but a lot of people just keep going like because i also with the cut there's less thc so you have to smoke more of it to get hot <laughs> So people just keep pushing through almost like bad liquor, right? Like I'm just keep chugging until I hit it. And eventually they get high enough, but there's all the other stuff happening too, right? So right. Yeah, you finally got high, but you smoked so much of the other crap. Your chest is hurting. You have a headache. The pen turned black. Um, all this stuff. I mean, all we that, saw yeah. all kinds of issues with those illicit carts. And that's the problem with, like you said, in Texas, like even if you knew it was bad, you have no good way to get legally clean stuff that you can at least trust. You know, you have to unfortunately get a friend to buy it and ship it or show up to California and fill up your suitcase and hope that you don't get <laughs> like, I'm right. crap out. we hear all the time people always on our info line like hey how can I get clean cannabis we're like you cannot we encourage you to only buy legally because we can't tell people what to do but we right. can all the time like hey I'm gonna go to California and do this I'm like why are you telling me this we're like <laughs> we cannot confirm we like like legally we have like a statement we just reply people we're like this is not legal what you're asking is not legal number one and number two, we can't consult you on it, you yeah, know? So, and we, yeah. And we won't, right? We just give them a very standard response of best of luck. We encourage you to shop legally in a state that has a dispensary. And we hope that you advocate for your place to get, you know, legal stuff. And we encourage them. We give them access right. to ASA. We say, hey, go to ASA, start a group, start a club, and like go talk to your city council. That's where a lot of stuff happens. It's a lot of very organic way it happens. A lot of times it's someone showing up at city council, having some, having a sick child their mother they're talking about it i mean i can't tell you how many times i've been to a conservative orange county and 
as anti as they are, someone on the city council or even the community is kind of like, well, yeah, I do have a friend that uses the oil and they do really like it. So I know it's not all bad, but I just know that you, you, you're trying to give it to kids. I'm like, no, I like, know it's just like, they, they they're just finding kill. they're just finding something else to yeah. pivot on once they're finding out that the efficacy of whatever cannabinoid it is that their friend or grandmother or grandfather is using they're having to backpedal and find another way to demonize it, you it, know? it precisely and that's yeah. what we constantly are dodging and combating and what we just keep fighting for like you said we're advocates of the plan we're advocates of this we want everyone to have access so we do have a lab we are a lab a lab is a lab but a lot of our mission on, on the, our corporate team and our company mission is to destigmatize and to help everyone else, you know, understand it better. And you know, eventually we hope that people are demanding tested cannabis. I and mean, obviously that's an end goal for the business that we want everyone to under to look for a can of safe see and feel confident that what they're um um that, that what they're using. Actually, it's crazy enough, we actually just got some, I guess, from a confiscated illegal meat, somebody was using um mock can of safe stickers on on, on oh. illegal products, you know, in order to because because they understand what that does for people. The, so well, the brand, the brand recognition, they're going to see your label and go, oh, okay, no, it was tested. It's got can't, can't exactly. safe yeah. And wow. it look, it's a shitty logo. It looks like crap, but <laughs> if you're not, you know, if you don't buy legal stuff, you wouldn't know it because you, because you don't go to the store and see our logos on all the legal stuff. So it's like, wow, like even the illicit market is branding with a lab, you know, like they're using, you know, like they're, they're going to get better. I remember after the NBC report, the last thing I say is I remember like the week after yeah. someone submitted some more testing, like people just send this stuff sometimes. And um, and uh, and the stuff that we can't accept, obviously, if, if it's coming from out of state, we're like, hey, we can't, you know, we, we can't deal with this. But like, if someone gives like a car and a store and an ID, we're like, yeah, sure, we'll test it if we pay for it. And um, uh, and I'll never get someone send something in, and we called them because they were from Michigan and something that was like, hey, we can't test this, but like this box literally said free of vitamin E. The next week, they're like, yeah, you know, I saw my guy had you know these new tested cars like the week after the study. The, 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 the TV show, whatever, the uh, the release. NBC, yeah. They're already updating the packaging to say, like, free of vitamin E acetate. Like, tested. Like, he was like, yeah, wow. you know, I, I saw your special, and then my guy had this new stuff, and we're like, how in the hell did they this quickly react to what's <laughs> out there? Like, this quickly. And we know, and we're like, we wish we could test it for you, man, but, like, this is clearly, like... <laughs> you can't. Not, yeah, it's a good state. Not cannabis. So it's just... Right. Such, and that's also what we want to get people access to. We... I mean, we're advocating for that too. Like, how come we can't help somebody out? Like, if someone is a legal citizen and they're not, you know, producing themselves or they're willing to give us their information for, you know, you to track later, how come we can't just test all of this stuff to right. give them, you know, to give them the confidence that wherever they are securing from, that maybe it is safe. You know, like why not at least allow us? Maybe we don't test for THC. Let let me test for everything else, and that's kind of what. Uh, some of these other labs have started to do in smaller states. Like I got a lab in Texas that I know, and I don't have one, but they'll just test things and won't test for THC because they know if they do, it'll like, you know, they'll know it's hot. So it's like, but it's like, you shouldn't have to do stuff like that. You shouldn't right. have to maneuver around the regulation. We should all be able to help support and to help um, get people to, you know, access the safe medicine. I mean, it's even tricky for us being, like I said, being a licensed entity, we don't want to jeopardize any of that. You know, we yeah. always do our, our goodwill, but you got to be careful with all these things. Hundred percent, man. Hundred percent. Well, really appreciate the work that Canna Safe is doing, and man, I look forward to hearing more about um, the legislation or you know that that relationship that you're trying to build with the local government to really start to educate. Yeah. Um, you know, and we have us back on. We can talk about the people that are helping us organize. We can talk about it more in depth and give some PR around that. We're certainly going to need you know some community support. Yeah. People writing letters advocating for it once we get it to the actual place you know where someone can vote it and yeah no we're certainly going to need some help but that's what we're, we're working towards we're going to make a commitment to what we say help the patient you know we really want to like that it's, it's a csr that we, we, we want to be able to say that we help the patient get better access and help the community i mean yeah we educate seniors uh as well you know like there's this um dispensary and oc bud and bloom has a senior shuttle they'll shuttle seniors in from a home to buy cannabis wow. at a close hour that's and so they, awesome. And they, and, they, and they let us come educate. And they had so many questions. And they were so curious. And they're looking for ways. They don't want to smoke. They want topicals. They want tinctures. They want teas. And they found they love these products. They love them, right? And right. Uh, they don't want to take all these pills. I mean, Yeah, they're, they're tired of the pills that they're taking. Exactly. They want to find another alternative. Yeah, exactly. that makes so much sense. And they wow. want a better quality of life, right? You know, they, they're not curing what they got. But they, they, they want a better quality of life. It's like, I'm not curing it with all these opiates. So why not let me 
smoke a little weed or take a tea and you know giggle a little bit so that's what <laughs> nice lady say you know it's like what's like why is this so wrong she's like this is she's like this is happiness and most active i've social i've been to she's like it makes me socialize as well you know like these people are trying to have a better quality of life yep uh, at this stage and they deserve it as well so yep things as such i mean that's what drives me here i mean like i said i i love this lab i love this team i love pushing the science analyzing it but my passion is clearly <laughs> uh, <laughs> some of the outside work that we do and it's honestly it's why i signed up i mean i wouldn't have committed to coming out here part of my agreement with aaron was getting to do this work i wouldn't have come out i wouldn't have taken the risk of canada safe if, if i didn't have this opportunity that i have right now i would have definitely stayed in my comfortable job right i think i if i didn't think i could have been able to impact people so most certainly right. I'm thankful thankful for this company giving me the opportunity to do just that well, hey, we're, we're thankful to have you on and we're thankful that you decided to make that transition into the industry um, because we need more smart, you know, experts and people like you. So Antonio, thanks again, man, for, for coming on today and chopping it up with me. And yes, we need to have you back on to talk about the progress you're making with the local government. And then uh, before we recorded, we talked about that cool idea of maybe like a weekend, like a Saturday uh -huh. doing uh -huh. a, a music totally podcast. So maybe totally we'll do that. Right. We got to get some people to submit what albums they want to hear or something, but I definitely think we should get something going because I think it's just a good way. I don't know. It's, 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 it's a vibe. I mean, music and cannabis is such a vibe. So why not? You know, let's, 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 talk, let's, let's just bring it out for everyone. Hell so, yeah. So. We'll, we'll do that. And I'll do, I'll do that idea. That's a great idea. We'll do a post and we'll open it up to, uh, to the, the public. And if they want to submit any recommendations, we'll, we'll jam it's out. Much, you get, it's gotta be a vinyl though. It's gotta be a full album. We're not doing cuts. We're doing straight. You know, so <laughs> Somebody got to find the right one to take us on a trip or to take us to set the mood because different vinyls give you different. I mean, that's what it is for me, right? I kind of set the music going. Am I chilling? Am I socializing? Right. What, what are we doing in this session? And the music can be very powerful, especially with vinyl. It, it can really enhance the experience and drive the experience too. So yep, I, yep. I think it'd be, I'm all about music. So I would love to get something going like that and get people to really uh, integrate the two because all that stuff's part of the experience. Even the color room you're in when you smoke in there. So I've read so many books about this stuff. I mean, like <laughs> people don't get, you know, you can't grab a, grab a bag of weed and expect the same experience. Your mood matters, you know, all that stuff matters. All that stuff is a part of uh, what you're doing. It's like if you're angry and you start drinking, you're less, you're more likely to do some stupid shit, right? You know, that's like, right. Yeah. When you're calm and you start drinking or you're drinking for happiness, but if you're pissed off and you start drinking, it's not like you get less pissed off. So, <laughs> no, it's in fact, the, it's the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like people don't realize that's probably not a good idea right now. You're not going to have, you know, but hey, that's unfortunately what we kind of expect or we don't control. And, you know, yeah, I don't know. There's, there's yeah. all these weird things that we don't take into account. Right. Our, and we're hoping we can educate some people on it, right? Hopefully we can help give them a better experience. That's what I really hope we can do is help people understand this better so they can figure out how to do it, you know, how to enjoy this plant without all the stigma or issues. Like how do parents, I mean, that's a big thing with parents too. I mean, I obviously don't use nearly as much with kids now, but it's like, how can you respectfully do this and responsibly, you know, uh, dose yourself, you know? Uh, right. That's a big conversation one that I'm not going to touch because of all patients. It's a, <laughs> right. We're major, all different there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a major conversation to, that needs to be had. Like I said, not, not a clean one, not mm -hmm. one that's going to be simple, but it needs to be had because we know it's out there. We know it's a thing. We know there's some parents that don't have any restrictions around it, which can scare me or the parents that think it's a zero tolerance and you shouldn't, you know, but I think there's got to be a better way for us to find that middle ground, especially knowing how therapeutic this is and can be for people and kids. Honestly, I mean, I'm saying the stories with the kids are some of the most beneficial stories out there. We're, we're, bio we're biologically married to the plant. We, exactly, regardless exactly. if you're a kid, an adult, uh, you know, an, an elderly person, doesn't matter. Um, and, you know, there's that, that kind of notion of having endocannabinoid deficiency, right? Where we're deficient with the cannabinoids that we want to marry with those receptors. So exactly. I totally yep. agree. Yeah, and exactly. Like eventually, I mean, I think this stuff will end up being vitamin esque. You know, I, I think you'll end up getting your vitamins, and people that want the classic experience of um, smoking will have the opportunity to. But I think eventually, the stuff ends up being dosable. It'll be in inhalers, it'll be in vitamins, it'll be in very rapid onset traditional ways of delivery at some point. They just got to figure out how they're going to let us do it. So, yep. The future of medicine, man, 100%. <laughs> For sure, well, Kevin, man. Let's let's run it back, man, soon, and uh, I'll get in touch with you about that that uh, music sesh. We'll we'll do yeah, it no, let's, let's 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 definitely do it, man. Definitely gonna need a good music session bringing this new year and get rid of twenty twenty. We need a good sage <laughs> session too. Get the Kyrie with the sage accord, sage sage everything yes. up in twenty twenty. 
in the yes. new year and let's uh let's start over man. <laughs> I'm, sure. I'm i'm taking a whole new outlook 2021 is gonna be a great year man for yeah, sure for sure all, all right, right later thanks for listening guys <laughs> bye, bye.